When you think about the question of where are the aliens, which I get asked a lot, this is like the Fermi paradox, where are the aliens? And I've not seen any evidence that there are aliens on Earth. A lot of people think there are aliens on Earth, and I'm like, great, I'd like to meet one. You know, for a while there, when I was getting my green card and everything, it said alien registration card. I'm like, okay. But uh, this, this question of where are the aliens is, uh, I think, a very profound one, because I'm aware of no evidence of aliens whatsoever, which means that I think we're probably alone. And if you look at the history of Earth, like how long has Earth been around? If, assuming that physics is correct, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Earth is about four and a half billion years old. When you think about the how, lo how old is civilization, I think the, the right measuring point for civilization, in my view, or, or a, a good measuring point, would be the advent of writing. So the first writing is generally considered to be the ancient Sumerians. Where are they now? They died out. But about 5,500 years ago, it was archaic pre-cuneiform. In fact, I suggest it's like an interesting rabbit hole to read about the history of writing. So if you consider, say, like, okay, civilization, I think if you don't have writing, you kind of need writing for civilization. But it's only been around for like a little over 5,000 years. Out of four and a half billion years that Earth has been around and the 13.8 billion years of the universe. So we're, all of human civilization is basically the blink of an eye. It's like a, just a fraction. It's almost, it's nothing. And I think that that probably means that that consciousness is incredibly rare and perhaps fleeting. It may not last for very long, because otherwise we would have, I think we would have seen aliens, some kind of sign of aliens. I think the most likely explanation is that consciousness is so rare that you, you, it, and does that consciousness actually extend to another planet? Does that consciousness extend to another star system? I mean, ultimately, if we're able to become a, a space-faring civilization, a multi-planet species, and ultimately a, a multi-stellar species, and go out there and explore all these star systems, I think we may find that there are many long-dead one-planet civilizations. We, and as you've heard me say before, we don't want to be one of those lame one-planet civilizations. I mean, we want to be a multi-planet civilization, ultimately be a multi-stellar civil, civilization, be out there among the stars. Like, you know make science fiction not fiction forever, kind of make Star, Star Trek real. That's, so that's why I think that there's a high urgency to making life multiplanetary. Because this is the first time in Earth's four and a half billion year history that it's been possible to extend life or consciousness beyond Earth. And we've got to do that while civilization is still strong. So that's the overarching goal of the company. It, when you think of it is extend life sustainably to another planet, Mars is the only option really, and to do, ideally before World War III or some kind of bad thing. The key thing is that we, we need enough people and enough tonnage on Mars such that Mars can survive and continue consciousness even if something would happen to Earth. Now I still think, well, obviously, I'm not talking about ab abandoning Earth or anything like that. And we want Earth to be as good as possible for as long as possible. But there are certain things that may be outside of our control. So, so we want to just get Mars to be a self-sustaining civilization as quickly as possible. And I think this can be done in around 20 years. And this you know, giant Starship factory that we're building is obviously key to that. And the launch sites that we're building here and at the Cape and elsewhere in the future will be key to that. So let's just go through that. Is extend life sustainably to another planet. Mars is the only option, really. And to do, ideally before World War III or some kind of bad thing. The key thing is that we, we need enough people and enough tonnage on Mars such that Mars can survive and continue consciousness even if something would happen to Earth. Now, I still think, well, obviously, I'm not talking about ab abandoning Earth or anything. It has to be like, if, if this was a movie, you'd be like, no way. <laughs> Come on, too implausible, but it's real. And it's due to you guys. Congratulations. This is the side by side of the three flights. You can see our thruster weight improved significantly. So we've, we've made tremendous progress from flight one to flight two to flight three. And we got flight four coming up in about a month or so. And with flight four, we should, if we get, you know, if fate smiles upon us, uh, we'll get through the high heating regime and smash into the ocean at a controlled spot. And then to hopefully be able to also do this with the booster, land on a, essentially a virtual tower. If the landing on the virtual tower with the booster works, then we will actually try with flight five to come back and land on the tower. Yeah. That's very much a success-oriented schedule, but, but it is in the realm of possibility. 
But I would say like the, the odds of us actually being able to catch the, the booster with the Mechazilla arms, the third decimal point, so like 13.8 billion something years, if, you're, if your civilization lasts a million years, it only goes, that third digit past the decimal point goes up one, and that's a million years. I mean, I'd say, like, we should think of, like, how do we make civilization last a million years? You know, we often get caught up in, like, the day-to-day -day things, but we want to have at least a million-year civilization, if not a hundred million-year civilization, or a billion-year civilization. A absolutely crucial to that goal is becoming a multi-planet species. People often ask, why Mars? Well, there's not a lot of options, frankly. <laughs> Venus is a, a superheated, high-pressure acid bath. Not, you don't, don't want to go to Venus. And then the moon is close, but it, it, it doesn't have an atmosphere, the gravity is only one-sixth that of Earth, and it's missing a lot of key resources. Also, the, the insulating value of the moon in Mars is much less. So if there's something that takes out Earth, like let's say there's a World War III, a, a global thermonuclear warfare, they'll probably throw a few nukes at, at the moon. <laughs> Whereas it's way harder to, to shoot Mars with nuclear... And we'd, Mars would see it coming and probably have some time to stop the inbound missiles. So the, the value of Mars... The, the, the difficult, or the distance, the third decimal point, so like 13.8 billion something years, if, you're, if your civilization lasts a million years, it only goes, that third digit past the decimal point goes up one, and that's a million years. I mean, I'd say, like, we should think of, like, how do we make civilization last a million years? You know, we often get caught up in, like, the day-to-day -day things, but we want to have at least a million-year civilization, if not a hundred million-year civilization, or a billion-year civilization. A absolutely crucial to that goal is becoming a multi-planet species. People often ask, why Mars? Well, there's not a lot of options, frankly. <laughs> Venus is a, a superheated, high-pressure acid bath. Not, you don't, don't want to go to Venus. And then the moon is close, but it, it, it doesn't have an atmosphere, the gravity is only one-sixth that of Earth, and it's missing a lot of key resources. Also, the, the insulating value of the moon in Mars is much less. So if there's something that takes out Earth, like let's say there's a World War III, a, a global thermonuclear earth, not you don't, don't want to go to Venus. And then the moon is close, but it, it, it doesn't have an atmosphere, the gravity is only one-sixth that of Earth, and it's missing a lot of key resources. Also, the, the insulating value of the moon in Mars is much less. So if there's something that takes out Earth, like let's say there's a World War III, a, a global thermonuclear warfare, they'll probably throw a few nukes at, at the moon. <laughs> Whereas it's way harder to, to shoot Mars with nuclear... And we'd, Mars would see it coming and probably have some time to stop the inbound missiles. So the, the value of Mars... The, the, the difficult... Or the distance and time required to get to Mars actually has an insulating benefit to the, for the continuation of consciousness, even if there's something terrible happens on Earth. And, and then once we go beyond Mars, there's, there's some asteroids like Ceres, some of the moons of Jupiter. The starship would ultimately be capable of, of reaching anywhere in the solar system. And then we'll need something, uh, a new level of technology to go to other star systems. But if we can't at least get to Mars, then other star systems are hopeless. I mean, it's a fixer-upper of a planet, okay? It needs some work, but it is, it's, it's really the only option for becoming multiplanetary. And long term, we can warm up Mars and we can, there, there would be, we can densify the atmosphere and there'd be a liquid ocean on about 40% of the surface. So we could make it an Earth-like planet. Earth could, we're unable to get even a small rocket to or orbit to now where we've done three, 327 successful launches, uh, almost 300 landings. In fact, you know, give it a few weeks and we'll have done three landings. 261 re Many times I was told that, that reusability was, was impossible and even if you did it, there would be no point because nobody would want to fly rockets that much. But now we routinely fly and, la and land the booster and we recover the fairing. So we've learned a tremendous amount from the Falcon program that is then feeding into the Starship program. And F Falcon and Starlink are what obviously keep the company going. I'd just like to give a hand to the, the Falcon team for the incredible work that they're doing. And then Dragon, wow, 45 launches of Dragon. It's amazing. And we've flown 50 crew members to orbit, 46 to the space station, and everyone has come home safely, which is the most important thing. You know, incredible work by the Dragon team. So let's give them a hand. That was, couldn't ask for a better outcome. And Starlink. Actually, if you, if you look at the sort of the, pl the plot of the, uh, all the satellites going around Earth. This look kind of scary, actually. But there's 6,000 satellites in operation. 
Oh, over 6,000. And 10,000 lasers, almost 3 million customers. So Starlink is doing a lot of good for people, for people on Earth who don't, either don't have internet access or it's very expensive. And so it's doing a lot of good, you know, on Earth. Because when, when I say we want to be a multi-planet species, I'm, you know, we obviously want Earth to be as good as possible and Mars to be, to be great. So uh, Starlink is, is doing a tremendous amount of, of that. And we're learning a lot by having this big fleet. Starlink will also be uh, very important for high bandwidth communication uh, to and on Mars for this. So there's going to be two launch towers here, and, I think, and then two launch towers at the Cape as well. So we'll have four launch towers for, for Starship probably you know, by sometime next year. We're aiming to have the first Cape launch tower and launch system operational around the middle of next year. And that'll be important for launch uh, at that are sort of fly over land. So I think what, what we should probably expect is that we, we do the kind of the development launches here, test anything new here, build the rockets, and then probably most of the operational launches would be from the Cape. So this year we're planning to build another roughly six boosters and ships, and, and that production rate will increase a lot uh, next year. That's why we're building the, the giant factory. Ultimately, we'll need to build a lot more ships than boosters, especially for Mars because it's the, you'll actually want to use the ship, take apart the ship and use it for raw materials on Mars because the ship materials will be so valuable. You, most of the ships you wouldn't want to bring back. You'd want to just use them for raw materials. Eventually, we will want to bring ships back, and I think we want to give people the option of coming back because they're more likely to want to go if there's... But I think most of the people that go to Mars will probably never come back to Earth and will need to ramp us. So there's going to be two launch towers here, ships back, and I think we want to give people the option of coming back because they're more likely to want to go if there's... But I think most of the people that go to Mars will probably never come back to Earth. And we'll need to ramp production to pretty high numbers. Like, I think ultimately probably a ship every... Like, multiple ships per day, basically. And then next year, we're aiming to demonstrate ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer. It's hard to make this not look a little bit naughty because it's two ships connecting and doing a fluid transfer. Just what it is. But it is, this is actually a very, important, this is a very important step on going to Mars because you need to, put, to get the ship to orbit and then do orbital refilling, kind of like aerial refueling. And that's really, you, you need about, about five or six refilling missions for every one mission that goes to Mars. So roughly five to one. And, and this will also be very important for the Artemis program for the NASA, to, to get back to the moon. So we'll want to have a ship that is, well, it's going to be a specialized ship for the moon, like this. <laughs> so the moon, obviously, there's no mechazella, so we need le landing legs. And uh, you don't need a heat shield, and uh, you don't need flaps, because there's no atmosphere. So the moon ship would be specialized. And uh, now ultimately, I think we, we want to build a moon base alpha and have a permanently occupied base on the moon. Like, that would be super exciting. And so you'd have a bunch of ships that are specialized for going to and from the moon, but they never come back to, they never land back on Earth. They just would, would uh, dock with propellant tankers to get orbital refilling. So in terms of performance, we've made dramatic progress on, on every level for Starship. It's remarkable that we can see the Raptor engines and how, how, it, how it has evolved from, you know, Optimistically, 185 tons, and I think ultimately we'll probably the booster engines will will aim to ha get the booster engines over 330 tons of thrust, which would mean 10,000 tons of total thrust at liftoff. And then the Raptor 3 also will not need a heat shield. So Ra Raptor 3 looks looks very simple, and it is actually simplified in a lot of ways. But a lot of the complexity is hidden because we have integral cooling channels in in many parts of the engine that don't exist in Raptor 2. So in order to not have a heat shield, it has to be very resilient. But that is actually what Raptor 3 would look like. It looks like Raptor 3 looks like it's missing a bunch of parts, but actually those parts have either been deleted or they've been integrated into the system, and like I said, with integral cooling channels. And where you need secondary plumbing, the secondary plumbing has also been integrated into the pump and into the chamber jacket, and yeah, so it's much simpler. It will, it's, yeah, it's actually extremely difficult to build Raptor 3, but, but it will be easy to integrate and will have higher performance and lower total mass and be more reliable.